Hey guys. So for some reason, the video just ended. I don't know why this is new technology for me. So here's part two of our first lecture on Mesopotamia, ancient Egypt and the Indus River Valley. Thank you for sticking with me through this. And I know it's, this is a little bit of a learning curve for all of us. Just so you know, this first lecture is a little long. I used to cover it in three days back when we had all of world history for us to learn about. Now I'm covering it in one day and I usually do it on a long day. So please be patient. Again, they're normally not going to be this long. So before we move on to Egypt, let's do a little multiple choice question, uh, practice. Use this as a way to assess your learning. See if you can answer it without the, um, without looking at your notes. So you're going to be answering this on ed puzzle. Um, so I'm not going to go over the answers here. Um, because you, I'm going to use it as an assessment tool to gauge your learning. It's not, I'm not grading this. I'm using this as a way to make sure that you're getting the information. Normally I would figure this out by just talking to you. But I can't. I'm not walking around the classroom. I'm not listening to what you're saying. I'm not seeing what you're writing down. So I have to do this. So number one, what are the criteria for a civilization? So which of these things, A, B, C, D, or E, is the correct answer? What counts as a civilization? Again, I'm going to move through this kind of quickly because you can pause and take as much time as you need. Oh, can't see the answers. All right. Number two, a massive pyramidal stepped tower made of mud bricks and associated with religious complexes in ancient Mesopotamian cities is known as a what? So what do we call those? The term city-state refers to all of the following except... So which of the following would not apply to a city-state? All right, part two, Egypt and the Indus River Valley civilization. We are gonna be moving through Egypt pretty fast. You could literally spend your entire career on ancient Egypt. Um, we're gonna spend 20 minutes. If you have more interest in it, I encourage you to self-study, watch videos, learn about it. Tell me what you learn if you learn anything cool. Also, if you're interested in ancient Egypt, take AP Art History. This is one of the civilizations that they look at in the course. You're going to be able to learn about their culture and their history um, through the pieces of art that they left behind. It's pretty cool. Okay. So the gift of the Nile. So the Nile River, first of all, is hugely important for ancient Egypt. That is something crucial that you have to understand. You don't have ancient Egypt without the Nile. Second, it flows north. So it flows from the Sahara Desert up through all of Egypt to the um, Mediterranean Sea. So you can see it starts right here and ends. This is new to me, guys. I'm testing this out. Boom. Look at that. What's up? I'm the best. All right. So we see that it flows from south to north which means that Upper Egypt is in the south and Lower Egypt is in the north. I know it's counterintuitive because all of our maps have the Northern Hemisphere up top, but that's completely arbitrary anyway. So, so what? All right. Just like Mesopotamian society is completely reliant on the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, the Egyptian society is completely dependent on the Nile. One of the key differences, though, 
is that the Nile floods in a very predictable way. So every September, you have this huge flooding. And when it floods, the river deposits silt. It deposits nutrients and mud and all kinds of good stuff that's really good for growing things. It's, it's fertilizer for your fields. We also see that the Nile River produces other resources for the Egyptian society. Reeds, stones, clay, papyrus. So, when we think of ancient Egypt, we all think of the pharaohs, right? This divine kingship. Well, pharaoh is actually a term that Egyptians wouldn't necessarily use to refer to their kings. It's a term that was used in the Hebrew Bible to refer to a specific Egyptian king that in English we've just adopted this term to all Egyptian kings. So we see that ancient Egypt has a monarchy, right? Um, they are going to have a king at the top of their social hierarchy. Throughout Egyptian history, you're going to have the center of power has shifted. Sometimes it's in the upper kingdom, right? Southern part of Egypt, sometimes it's the lower kingdom. Eventually, we see that Egypt is a large unified body. And in general, Egyptian historians can have identified about 30 dynasties. So we divide this into the old, middle, and new kingdoms. And in between each one, we have these intermediate periods. It is the job of the pharaoh, of the king, to maintain ma'at. Ma'at is the Egyptian term for the concept of divinely created and maintained order. So it is the king's job to maintain this order, right? Egyptians hated chaos. Everything was about order. So pharaohs, the king, is considered to be a reincarnation of the god Horus, who is the sky god. So you can tell a good king is maintaining Ma'at because he's providing for the welfare and prosperity of his country. When a king died, he was buried often in these elaborate tombs. The idea was that after a pharaoh died, he would go to rejoin the gods. And so he had to be buried with the things he might need in the afterlife. Now that might be his favorite dog. It might be his favorite foods and wine. It might be his favorite concubines or slaves. So of course we all know the Egyptian pyramids, right? These are these massive tombs. Well, you know, these massive tombs also signify, Hey, look, here's a giant building that says, rob me. I have tons of money in me. I have a Pharaoh's riches in me. So later Pharaohs are going to hide their tombs. Um, so they are not so easily robbed. So we see these massive monuments built. How? Right? It's not like they have power drills or um, jackhammers or anything, really. You have simple stone tools. You have levers. You have pulleys and you have rollers. And yet they built these huge monumental structures. So... During the flood season, when you can't farm, people would be pressed into labor to make these monumental structures. All right, so for our purposes, you do not need to know these three, like details about these three kingdoms. But I'm going to go over them very quickly. So the old kingdom is going to be from 3100 to 2500 BCE, because remember, in BCE, we're moving towards zero as we move towards the future. It's going to include King Menzies, who's gonna be the founder of our first Egyptian dynasty, who united Upper and Lower Egypt. During this time, we see the height of the Pharaoh's power. Egypt is gonna be ruled by a strong government, and the Pharaoh is really the guy who's ultimately in charge. 
eventually we'll start to see that priests and other officials are demanding more power, but we see a very strong economy during this time. Next is the Middle Kingdom from 2100 to 1650 BCE. And remember, between each one of these intermediate periods, they're often a little chaotic. We see that changes are made to the government at this point, so Pharaoh does not have complete power. It is during this time we have our one and only female Pharaoh, our female ruler. We see more trade with neighbors, a development of a middle class, but the middle kingdom ends with invasion. They get invaded by the Hykos, a Turkish nomadic group. Um, and they're conquered. So finally, we have the new kingdom from 1550 to 700 BCE. We have a reestablishment of Egyptian rule. We see Egyptians conquer many neighboring civilizations, including the Nubians to the south, I think Sudan, Syrians to the northeast. And one of their goals here is to create buffer zones so they don't get conquered again. Slavery is going to be used among the elite. You have a brief 20-year blip in Egyptian history from 1353 to 1336 called the Amarna period, where they briefly became monotheistic and like everything about art changed, and it was very weird. At the end of the New Kingdom, there is a power struggle between government officials, and the empire is divided into smaller states. These smaller states are weaker, and they get conquered. All right, so how is all of this organized? Well, we see that different kingdoms would put their capitals near their power base. So Memphis, here in Lower Egypt, let me find that little doodad again. Lower Egypt is going to, um, be the center of power for the um, old kingdom. So that's why we have the pyramids there, right? Whereas the middle and new kingdom will center their power down here, right? In near Thebes, right? Thebes. Um, this is for a few reasons, right? They're going to be better protected down here. Um, near the Nile River Delta, you have a lot of resources, but also floods the worst. So we see that we have extensive administrative systems from the village level to districts that divided the entire kingdom. And you would have a central government in the capital, right? So this is very different from Mesopotamia, which is a bunch of city-states that are constantly fighting each other. Here you have a single government ruling a massive area and you have stable governments at every level. You see that bureaucrats will keep track of land, products, um, people, taxes. Government controls the economy and long distance trade. So ancient Egypt is doing trade with Mesopotamia. We have an administrative class of people, right? Who are literate, um, scribes, so in general as well, we see that Egypt is much more rural, much less urbanized than Mesopotamia. And geography plays into that. So look at Egypt. They have the Mediterranean Sea to the north. They are surrounded on the African continent by the Sahara Desert. To the east, they have the Red Sea and the Sinai Peninsula. So they are geographically protected from invasion for the most part, right? The, um, that blip on the radar um, from the Turkish invaders was not common. So because of that, they're very isolationist. They don't feel the need to interact with other people. They kind of feel themselves are better than all the other kingdoms. Whereas Mesopotamia is smack dab in the middle of everything between the Indus River Valley civilization and Egypt. So they're doing trade, they're doing business, they're interacting with everyone, and they are getting lots of cultures and cultural traits diffused to them. Egypt's more interested in controlling resources than conquering territory. 
So let's talk about the people of Egypt. We have distinct social classes again, right? At top, you have priests, high-ranking officials, the king at the very top. Then you have lower level officials, then peasants, which make up most people. We see that there is actually two writing systems in place in Egypt, hieroglyphics and then a cursive script that was easier to write. We see that there's no formalized class structure in Egypt like in, they had in Mesopotamia. Women could own and inherit property. Marriage was monogamous, but could be easily done and easily dissolved, so more like a significant relationship. There's limited knowledge about what the experience for women was like in Egypt and in the ancient world, but in general, if you were a woman in Egypt, you probably had it better than women elsewhere. So, what do they believe? Well, again, all beliefs are rooted in your natural environment, in this case, the Nile River. So, because the Nile River is predictable, it is life-giving, it's reliable, that is how they viewed their gods, right? The natural world is a place of recurrent cycles and periodic renewal. The sky was a great ocean. So you have the sun god, Ra, who is reborn every morning and travels across the sky. You have the god Osiris, king of the underworld. The pharaoh is in general going to be associated with rebirth. We see gods are very diverse, some with animal heads. They have a distinct belief in the afterlife, and to be prepared for it, you would be mummified. So you'd be entombed with the things you need, and your body would be ready to come back to life. Egyptians were polytheistic. Um... And they were very knowledgeable. I mean, mummification means they had the best knowledge of anatomy and medicine of anyone. So they knew about anatomy, math, astronomy, engineering. They had these amazing architectural structures. And then, of course, they have hieroglyphics. So we all know hieroglyphics. I'm sure in like your elementary school class, you might have even like written things in the hieroglyphics. They are a system of writing which uses pictorial symbols to represent syllables, sounds, and concepts. So until the Rosetta Stone, we couldn't understand it. So we, um, the Rosetta Stone is a hugely important thing in archaeological history because it had um, hieroglyphics at the top, then informal Egyptian, and then Greek. It had the same text. In these three different ways so then we could actually translate hieroglyphics it was huge um egyptians don't get bronze until after they're conquered by those turkish invaders um because they didn't interact with other people okay great video from national geographic about ancient egypt what role did the environment and religion play in the evolution of the egyptian civilization so pause, see if you can answer this, but I'm going to continue on. We're going to do just a couple practice questions before we move on to the Indus River Valley. So number four, remember we end with number three with Mesopotamia. The culture that developed in Egypt was unique largely because of which of the following? According to Egyptian belief, the function assigned by gods Two Egyptian kings was to maintain Ma'at or the. So, what was Ma'at? What was the job of the pharaohs? Okay, almost done, guys. Indus River Valley, we are barely going to spend any time on because we don't know anything about it. So, Indus River Valley, it's by the Indus River. So, um, think Western India, Pakistan. We see that it's going to emerge between 3000 and 1900 BCE. We know that there are two huge cities, there's Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro, but we don't know a lot. We don't know what gave rise to urbanization. We don't know what caused a population increase. We don't know what kind of technological advances they have. Harappa has evidence of writing, but we can't translate it. Um, 
we know that these cities were huge. Um, Harappa had a population of 35,000 and Mahenjo-daro was much larger. We know that these cities were well organized, that they had sewer systems, that the cities were laid out in grids, that there's uniformity in construction. So that indicates urban planning, that indicates a strong central authority, right? Someone has to make those decisions. We see that both the large and smaller settlements are uniform, indicating extensive communication and trade. Geographically, we know that they had predictable flooding, right? So you have flooding from the melting in the Hindu Kush, and then you have the monsoon rains. So a couple times a year, you're getting this consistent flow of water. Um, we're not ready for that yet. We know they had more metal than Mesopotamia and Egypt, um, but, and they would use it for tools, not just jewelry. We know that they had technological breakthroughs like irrigation, the potter's wheel, kilns. Um, we don't know about their political system, society, economy, religious institutions. We don't really have any evidence of social classes. We don't have any remains of large temples or palaces or no evidence of an organized military. But cities did have fortifications and people used bronze knives and spears but for hunting or for fighting, unclear. We know that they traded with Mesopotamia, Southeast Asia. Um, we know that they grew wheat, barley, peas, melon, sesame. But then they disappear. The cities are just abandoned around 1900 BCE, and we don't really know why. There's this idea of like a system failure. Again, we don't know. So. Uh, there was some sort of breakdown between the fragile relationship between political, social, and economic systems. Maybe there was a flood, right? Or an earthquake or a river dried up. Maybe we see solemnization of their water supply. Um, maybe malaria. Maybe they were conquered by the Aryans in 1500. We don't know. So, a great video on the Indus River Valley. Again, love these crash course videos. Optional, but I do recommend it. All right, name the a development for each of our major River Valley civilizations. What caused the decline of these River Valley communities? All right, so briefly, I want to go just sort of think big picture about this. We see our earliest civilizations are going to have high levels of political centralization, urbanization and technology. They're all going to be situated in river valleys. So they're going to rely on flooding and river water irrigation because of insufficient rains. We know that they had to use lots of manpower for construction. This means political organization to build these things. We know that Egypt and Mesopotamia at least had monarchies. We don't know whether in this river valley did or not. We know that the flooding for Mesopotamia was very random, but predictable in Egypt. And this really impacted how they viewed the world, whether it was a dangerous or a safe place. Last set of practice questions before our summary. So Mesopotamia, Egypt, and the Indus River Valley civilizations were all, what did they all have in common? All right, for your summary, and remember, you're going to be answering your summary on your daily cover page, I'd like you to compare ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, and the Indus River Valley civilization. Identify at least four similarities and or differences. Remember, summaries need to be in complete sentences. They should be at least five sentences, right? The more thoughtful you are in your summary, the less studying you have to do later, right? This is where the thinking happens. I've just been talking for like an hour. You've been listening, maybe taking some notes, but for the most part, it's been pretty passive. If I asked you tomorrow to do this, like would you be able to or would you need to look, look back at your notes? This practice of summarizing what you just learned in your own words helps you to put the information in your head so you don't have to study so much later. Thanks guys, have a great day.